Well, I was commissioned in the Marine Corps as a second lieutenant in 1958. And in the spring of 1960, I was based at uh, Camp Schwab in Hanoko, Okinawa, which I thought was just a beautiful, beautiful place. And I, I really fell in love with Orawan, uh, the harbor there. It's just such a beautiful site. I thought I was very, very lucky to be there. Uh, and the unit I was in that spring participated in a joint operation training exercise with the Chinese Nationalist uh, Marine Corps on the southern tip of Taiwan. And while we were ashore, when we'd eat our sea rations at night, as soon as we were finished, we'd be surrounded by little Taiwan kids begging for our sea ration cans so that they could patch their tin roofs. Uh, this was the beginning of my, of my change, uh, which over the next eight years took me from being a Marine Corps officer to being a peace activist. I was astonished that we could be spending so much money on this training exercise when our allies, on Taiwan were living in such extreme poverty. I was surprised a year later when I was stationed in North Carolina uh, that I didn't have to go very far from Camp Lejeune to find similar poverty. Uh, from North Carolina, I went to the island of Vieques uh, off the tip of Puerto Rico with Marine Corps essentially owned half of the island, which we were in the process of destroying with munitions and with pollution of various kinds. Uh, so that I was getting more and more disillusioned about the role of the American military. But what really uh, made my final decision inevitable was when I was transferred to a national security agency field activity, again on Okinawa, uh, where we were monitoring the uh, North, North Vietnamese communications at the time of the Tonkin Gulf incident. And when Lyndon Johnson used that incident in the Bay of Tonkin to drag America into war, I knew I would have to resign my commission and change my career. I will say though, the wonderful thing about being on Okinawa for the second time was that both of my children, my son and my daughter, were both born at Camp Kui uh, Hospital on Okinawa. And uh, my son's earliest memories are of, of Okinawa. Uh, we, just, we had a wonderful life there. But then I went back to the University of California at Berkeley uh, and uh, studied political science to try to understand how America had become such a rogue nation. And I've been a peace and justice activist ever since. And in, I've made a couple of trips back to Okinawa, I think three so far. Uh, to stand with the protesters uh, in Hanoko, uh, trying to stop the expansion uh, of Camp Schwab and the building of the airfield there. And my first trip back, uh, we arrived and we were introduced to a woman just about my age, maybe a little bit older. Uh, we were told that she was the spirit of the resistance, that if she wasn't there, every day that they knew she must be sick. And this was uh, Shimabukuro Fumiko. And when I was introduced to her, uh, we were talking through an interpreter. And I said, you know, in 1960, I was working on the other side of this fence. And she said, well, in 1960, I was also working on the other side of this fence. I said, well, where were you working? She said, in the bachelor officer's quarters. 
And I said, in the spring of 1960, were you one of the maids who challenged the officers to a game of volleyball and just beat the crap out of us? And she gave me a big smile and said, yes, I was, I was. And we hugged each other and became great buddies. I will add one thing, and that is that the Okinawans have the right idea. They are amazingly wise and strong. And it's the only place I know where there's a memorial, a war memorial that honors the dead of all sides, uh, whether they were Japanese, American, Okinawan, Korean, whether they were military or civilian, that all the dead that died in that horrendous battle on Okinawa are honored there at the Peace Park, at the cornerstone of peace. So thank you, Okinawa. <laughs>